Because I knew my father would say, he didn't talk about me negative in any way. There's no reason to. Next day, I go to the cafeteria in the morning and he comes up to me. And he says, Michael, you know, uh, I just assume your dad, you know, you walked away and there was some talk on the yard. I said, I didn't ask you that. I asked you specifically what my father said. I asked you a direct question. I want a direct answer. I said, but you can't answer me because my father never said anything. I said, you're looking to impress those two goons you got standing next to you? I said, don't do it with me. I said, let me explain something to you. Don't ever, ever try to come between me and my father. Ever. Don't do it again. Michael Francis here. Welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, yesterday was Labor Day, kind of the end of the summer. Today is uh, Tuesday. We're getting into the fall season pretty soon. I don't know about where any of you are, but we've had a heat wave out here in Southern California. 121 degrees in the San Fernando Valley. I'm out here in Newport. It was about 98. Uh, night times are beautiful, but a little rough during the day. But you know what? I wouldn't trade it. Everything else is good. Before I get started, I want to give a shout out, a happy birthday shout out to Cole Wortham. He is a young follower of mine, a new subscriber, uh, said some wonderful comments on some of the videos that we've been showing. And he's celebrating his birthday on September 30th. So, Cole, thank you for being a supporter. I wish you a happy birthday. Tell all your friends that uh, you got somebody that's got your back now. You got a mob guy uh, wishing you a happy birthday, but enjoy it. So today, what am I going to do? I'm going to do something a little bit differently today, people. I want to get a little bit serious with all of you. And this is based upon many of the comments and the questions that I've been receiving uh, from so many of you. I'm, I'm talking about hundreds of you over the past several weeks, and that's across all of the social media platforms. You know I'm all over the place. I'm on every one of the platforms and get a lot of the same questions on and on and on. I want to answer some of them today. They're very personal to me. So uh, we're going to talk about that. And the main question I get all the time is really two. One, the real relationship with my father, you know, how we uh, got on certainly towards the end of his life. And then uh, one that's even more asked more uh, frequently than that is, why did I really leave the mob life? So I'm going to tell you about that. I can tell you right now, it wasn't any one particular thing that, that led me to make this decision. It was a number of things. And I want to make this clear. I'm going to go over them, but I want to make this clear. I didn't leave because I was mad at anybody. I didn't want to get revenge on anybody. Um, I'm not complaining about the life as, uh, as it applied to me. I made some very conscious moral decisions to walk away, and I'm going to talk about that. And it was something that built up over time. And some of you may disagree with me. You may say, well, you know what, Michael, no matter what, you broke your oath, you broke a murder, you talk about it. And you know what? You're right. Uh, I did. Now, certainly I'm not the only one, but that doesn't matter. Two wrongs don't make a right. My father always taught me that. You don't ever justify what you did by saying somebody else did it also. That's not the way to do it. I took an oath. I broke my oath. I take responsibility for that. But I believe I did it for the right reasons. And I'm going to go into that now over the course of my kind of lifetime in that life. You know, first thing that kind of happened to me, uh, and this was even before I was a made guy, um, I told you about that incident with Joe Colombo and my dad, and I wondered why you know, um, Joe Colombo didn't hurt, help my dad a little bit more when he went to prison. Um, that kind of stuck in my head, but I went over that. I mean, I got made after that incident happened. Uh, but you know what happens over a period of time? You start to look back and you start to put all these things together and you start to say, is this what I really want to do for the rest of my life? Now, difficult to get out of that life. I understand when you make that decision, that's a decision that you're in for life. But, you know, I did what I did, and I'm going to, again, explain the succession. You know, as we go along, though, I want to tell you a couple of things that happened and really kind of opened my eyes. I had a, a friend of mine. It was another made guy. We were both soldiers at the time. I wasn't a capo. His name was Benny. I wasn't, I'm not going to give you anything more than that. Uh, he had a brother in that life, and he had a father in that life. His father uh, brought both brothers in, got them both made. Well, when Benny and I were pretty close. One day I was driving him home. And uh, he lived in Brooklyn. We got to his house and I was going to drop him off. 
And he said to me, Mike, wait here, don't leave yet. I said, okay. I thought maybe he wanted to give me something. I wanted to make sure somebody was home. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, he goes up to his door. I'm waiting in the car. He's got the key, opens the door, and he looks in. I think he was, I don't know what he was doing. He was standing at the doorstep for a second, shuts the door, comes back in the car. And I said, Benny, what's the matter? He said, well, nobody's home. I says, well, okay, I saw you got in, you had the key, you opened the, the door, you got yourself in. He said, yeah, Mike, but nobody's home. I said, well, it's your house, what are you worried about? He said, you know, I gotta be honest with you, Mike, and this is the story. 30 years prior to this, he and his brother had a contract on their dad. Dad said something wrong. I think he was inappropriate with another maid guy's wife or daughter, something to that effect. And the contract was given to the two brothers to kill the father, and they did it. And he said to me, Michael, ever since that day, I can never be in my house alone. He said, if somebody's not in the house, I can't walk in the door because I'm haunted by my father and about the thought of this. He says, I see him in almost every room. And it was kind of shocking to me. I said, man, you know, a guy killed his father. I understand what he did was inappropriate. It was against our rules. But to have a contract on your dad, I don't know that I could ever do that. As a matter of fact, I'm sure I could never do that. But I just said, man, what, you know, what kind of life is that? Thought about it. It was early on in my life. Just put it away. We move on. You know, I told you, I think that, you know, once or twice, I think my dad could have stood up for me a little bit more when I was put on the spot, making more money than I was turning in, maybe in the gas business. He put me on, my, on the spot. Boss did. Could have been serious. My dad didn't really stand up for me. I don't want to say he talked negative about me. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. I can say until this day, I don't believe my dad talked negative about me to anyone. He might have taken the high road. He might have not said anything to defend me. But I don't believe he talked bad about me. As a matter of fact, I'd almost guarantee that. And that stuck in my mind. I said, man, you know, why would my dad do that? Again, time passes, years pass. Another time, I'm in prison. As I, I, I want to make this point when I say my dad never talked bad about me. I, I'll kind of prove it to you. I'm in prison. And I'm walking the yard with Jeffrey McDonald. I'm in Sheridan, Oregon. Two guys, they look like, you know, tough guys, bodybuilders, come up to me on the track and they say, so-and-so wants to see you. Now, I knew that this guy was, he wasn't a made guy, but he's a knock-around guy. He'd come out of Brooklyn. I said, all right, tell him when I'm done. I'll pass by and I'll go see him. Where is he? He said, he's sitting over on the bench. I said, all right, when I get my lap, I'll come and see him. I finished the lap. I said, Jeffrey, excuse me. I got to go talk to this guy. And I go there and he's sitting on the bench, right? He's like on the top of the bench, not even on the seat, on the top, right? The two guys are standing next to him, like they're his two guys, right? And I said, what could I do for you? Now, he had just gotten there. He wasn't there too long. He just got transferred in there. He got transferred from Petersburg, the prison there. That's where my father was. And he looks at me, and he's got his sleeves rolled up, and he's sitting there, and he says, you know, I left your father in Petersburg. He's not too happy with you. Now, this is after I had walked away. It became public. And I looked at him, and I said, really? What did my father say? He said, well, he's not too happy with you. I said, well, no, no, no. I want you to explain exactly what my father said. I said, I'll tell you why. I said, after I leave here, I'm going to get a message to my father, and I'm going to find out exactly what he said, if he said anything to you, because I'm telling you that he didn't. And if you made a mistake and you're saying something wrong, you're going to have a problem. I'm telling you right now. And I turned around and walked away. Because I knew my father don't say, he didn't talk about me negative in any way. There's no reason to. Next day, I go to the cafeteria in the morning, and he comes up to me. And he says, Michael, you know, uh, I just assume your dad, you know, you walked away and there was some talk on the yard. I said, I didn't ask you that. I asked you specifically what my father said. I asked you a direct question. I want a direct answer. I said, but you can't answer me because my father never said anything. I said, you're looking to impress those two goons you got standing next to you? I said, don't do it with me. I said, let me explain something to you. Don't ever, ever try to come between me and my father. Ever. Don't do it again. And that was it, because I was so sure my father never said negative until this day, because he and I had a, a definite understanding between us. But I want you to I want to make that clear again. What led up to my walking away from that life? I was making a lot of money. People knew about it. I had the Russians. 
I want to be make this clear again because people have said certain things. I never said I created the gas tax scheme. What I will say, I did it better than anybody else. I did it better than gas pipe. Gas pipe wasn't in it first. You know how gas pipe castle got into the business? I put him there because he had a guy by the name of Marat. It wasn't his guy yet. Marat Balagula, who was a Russian guy, who we tried. My guy, Ayarizo, tried to move in on some of his stations. Balagula ran to Queso. And that's how Queso got into the business. I was there first. But he made some money. Great. There was enough money to go around. No problem. I didn't invent it. The Russians didn't invent the scam. But I did it better than anybody. I will tell you that. And I, I share the credit with Ayer Rizzo. He was a genius when it came to this stuff. I just helped us expand in a way that nobody else could. I was able to get the licenses. We were able to buy the stations. We did it better than anybody. And you know what? There's so much documentation out there to prove it. I don't have to make this up. It's out there. Look it up. It's there. I was indicted for it. Not only in New York under, a RICO, under the RICO statute and the feds, but in Florida, too. It's all over the place. I don't have to make this up. It is what it is. Another thing that happened in that life that kind of eye-opening to me. There was a story, I believe it was Newsday, don't hold me to it, I don't remember, it was a long time ago, that came out that said that I was making so much money I was going to break away from the Colombo family and stop my own family, the Francis family. There wasn't an ounce of truth to it. It was a fictionalized story. Some reporter made it up, not even an ounce of truth. I was loyal to my boss, Carmine Persico, would never think any other way, right? Got into people's heads. I had the Russian crew, I'm making all this money, I got a jet plane, a helicopter, you know. One thing in that life you got to understand, there's a lot of envy in that life. There's a lot of jealousy. And I, I tell you what, there's a difference between jealousy and envy. Jealousy, you see something somebody has, oh, I wish I had that. It's natural, it's normal. You know, I wish I had that nice house, that nice car. You know what envy is? I wish I had that and I wish he didn't have it. That's envy and that's what happens in the mob life. It's unfortunate. But that's a product of that life. I understood it. I got it. Okay, so I'm in the I'm in the bullpen, you know, the holding tank when you're in jail. I was locked up on on uh, on this whole gasoline case. Carmine Persico was in there. He was a boss, and my underboss Jerry Lang. Persico calls me over. Now we were close, you know. He made a ton of money with me, ton of money through the gas business. He says to me, Michael, you know, what's this stuff I hear? Jerry Lang was standing there, so I had the boss and the underboss and me. I was your captain at the time. He said, Michael, what's the story about you breaking away from the Columbos? I said, Junior, you believe this nonsense? I said, why? When they write about me, it's true. When they write about everybody else, it's not true. I said, come on, Junior, it's nonsense. He says, and you know, it says you made like $2 billion. I said, Junior, how is anybody going to know it? How is a reporter going to understand what we made? I said, come on. I'm taking all the risk here. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the right thing with the family. I put this deal together. You've been supporting me. We won every sit down. I appreciate it. But come on, don't, don't say that to me. And he looked at me and he said, you know what it means if it's true, don't you? And I thought about it. Yeah, I know what it means. It means if it's true and I'm stealing from the family, not doing all, I'm going to get hit. Okay, I get it, Junior. Yeah, that wasn't, I didn't appreciate that. I'll be honest with you. Okay, but that, again, that in itself did not cause me to walk away. I'll tell you what caused me in a lot of ways. I'm watching the destruction of my family. My mom and dad, you know, 33 years she did without a husband. Her life was destroyed. Her relationship my, with my father to it was ugly. She didn't want to be in the marriage. I told my father, I said, Dad, you're doing all this prison time. You keep going back to prison. Every time you come out, you violate. My dad violated five times. I mean, come on. How many times are you going to make the same mistake? I said, Mom doesn't want to be in this marriage. Let her go. Let her go. He didn't want to. He loved her. Whatever the reason, he didn't want to. Maybe it was pride. I don't know. He wouldn't let her go. And she, she got, it was so ugly towards the end. My brother, drug addict, had a lot of resentment towards my father. I'll be honest with you. My sister died of an overdose of drugs. My younger sister, she didn't even regard my dad. Because he was away most of her whole life. She dies young of cancer. Family destroyed, devastated. And look, I appreciate my father sticking to, to Omerta, never testifying against anybody. I respect that. He's an old timer. But on the other hand, your family's destroyed. I'm not telling you to, to put people in jail and rat on people. I'm not telling you that. But 
I mean, come on, you got to do something, Dad. The family is destroyed. And I'll be honest with you, people. I don't know any family of any made member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated. It's a bad life in that regard. So all of these things are in my mind. I would have still never walked away. I would have never walked away. But then I meet my wife, this young girl, young Christian girl. I fell in love with her. And I said, what am I going to do? Am I going to be in love with this woman and then go to jail for the rest of my life? I said, no. I said, to me, I got to make a break. So she was the catalyst. If I don't meet her, people, I'm telling you, I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life because I would have never walked away. She was the strong incentive that I needed to make the break. And I'll tell you how difficult it was for me. In 1991, um, we had a war in our family. We were just starting. I had already walked away. It was publicized. I felt such a pull on me to go back into that life because I said, look, I, I got to help my guys. I felt such a pull. What happened was I was making the decision to go back to New York and help. And then I get violated and I get thrown back in a hole. It was almost like God said, no, no, you're not going back. I'm not going to let you go back. I'm throwing you in a hole. You're going to stay there. For I was in the hole for the entire time that the war went on. A bunch of guys got killed. A lot of guys went to jail for life. And I'm sitting in a hole. Saved my life. So you got to understand succession. And I want to make this clear. When I took my plea, I had no cooperation agreement. I took a plea so that I can wrap everything up, go to jail, do a couple of years. My mom, I didn't have a cooperation agreement at that point in time. Not at all. The only thing I, I did when I took my plea is that any crime that I committed prior to the date that I took the plea, they couldn't prosecute me for except for murder. I have no immunity for murder. I'm not saying I committed murder. I spent 25 years in that life, but I'm not saying I committed murder, but I have no, until this minute, I have no immunity for that. And why do I want to talk about it anyhow? Why? Is that what you want to hear from me? I don't think so, people. I don't think so. And I want to tell you this too. Nobody knows, okay, the conversations that my father and, and, and I had towards the end of his life, towards the last couple of years. And there were some things that, yes, I was upset with him about. Maybe he was upset with me. We have a different ideology. My dad, it was more important to him to die with his boots on, to be a legend in his life than anything else. And, you know, I said, Dad, I get it. I understand it. But our family's been destroyed. I said, my mother, I spent the last several months with her before she died. She told me things that were just disappointing, Dad. Disappointing. And I love you. I'll never not love you, Dad. But we just think differently. You know, and I don't have anything bad to say about my father. I loved him since I was a kid. He was a good dad to me. But you know, understand this too. You know, my dad met my mother when she was 16 years old. He was 17 years older than her. She was a kid. My daughter's 22. I still think she's a kid. What do you know at 16 up against a mob guy that's 17 years older than you? She didn't know what she was getting into. And she, she loved my dad. She fought for him for a long time, but it got too much just got too much. And anybody wants to talk about my family, they don't know the intimacy of my family. Nobody knows that, people. Nobody knows the stuff that went on between me, my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters. Nobody knows that. People want to talk, they can talk. A lot of people want to talk uh, on the Francis name. It's relevance for them, you know. Francis, our name means something. So, I want to clear all of that up. I say this again. I left that life for the right reasons. I don't like to talk about him, but I'm going to tell you something, too. People have asked me about Sammy the Bull. Let me tell you about Sammy. We didn't know each other really well on the street, but Sammy was the real deal. 100%. As a matter of fact, he, he absolutely outranked me. He was the underboss. I was a capo. I respected him for that. He's the real deal. And if you do hear from Sammy, you're going to hear the real stuff because he is the real deal. And I guarantee you this. A lot of guys out there talking about violence and Sammy don't want to talk about that. He's looking to turn his life around. He's home. He's a grandfather. He's, he's making his way. He don't want to talk about that stuff. He's the real deal. He, nobody enjoys that. He did what he had to do. I'm not going to pass judgment on him. And he doesn't pass judgment on me. It's the way it is. Anyway, hopefully we cleared all of this up. Um, I know it's a little different than what you're used to hearing, but 
you know, you people have been very loyal to me. You know, this channel is growing very, very quickly. And uh, I appreciate the support. And we're going to keep providing good content. And I want to tell you this. I'm not here to tell you mob war stories. I'm not bringing every other mob guy in creation because really, you know, other than me and Sammy, there's not too many guys. There's nobody out there that really can talk about the life like we can. We were really involved. But I'll tell you who I am going to bring. I'm going to bring you um, Mike Tyson. Why? Because he transformed his life. I'm going to bring you Daryl Strawberry. Why? Transformed his life. I want to hear stories like that, and I think you do too. Bruce McNall, okay, was up, down, on the comeback trail, transformed his life. Molly Bloom from Molly's Game. These are the people that you're going to hear from, real people that had it tough in life and have been able to make a comeback, pretty much like me. By the grace of God, I can sit here and talk to you because it could have been a lot worse for me. Maybe it should have been. For some reason, I'm here to talk to you. Those are the kind of things you're going to hear on this channel as we continue to go forward. And I hope you stay involved. And yeah, I like to give a lesson. I like to give a moral when I'm done. Because otherwise, what do you need these stories for? You can go to movies and watch a movie. I want you to hear something from me. I want to finish up with this. Okay, for all you young kids out there, listen to this. When I was in prison, I spoke to so many of these young bang bangers coming into jail. Every one of them had the same script, broken home, no father figure in the house, mom trying to do her best. Maybe she couldn't because she was young, had you at a young age. And these kids grow up like wild animals. They get involved with a local gangbanger, a local drug dealer. Before you know, they end up in prison because they're doing their bidding or God forbid something worse, a cemetery. And boy, I counsel them because I have a heart for kids. I tried to tell them, stay off the street, man. Go back, get yourself a job, get yourself a family and live your life the right way. I'm working with Major League Baseball in 1996. They asked me to come and speak to some kids in a detention center in Manatee County, Florida. We get there. The sheriff looks at me and says, Francis, you got 15 minutes. I said, what am I going to do in 15 minutes with these kids? I said, you know what? I'm not going in. He said, all right, let's see how it goes. I go in there, talk to 12 kids, ages 16 through 21. You know how long I was there? Two and a half hours. He let me go. Tears in their eyes. Because when I said to them, you know what, when I leave here, there's nothing I can do for you. You're going to have to do this for yourself. Get out of this place and go straight. If you're in a bad neighborhood, you got to get out. You know what, there are churches and ministries out there that will help and support you, and I'll direct you there. Because I want to help these kids. There's a moral to these stories. All of these stories have the same moral. you got to play it straight in life, people. There's no other way. you got to play it straight in life. If I'm anything, I'm an example of that. So that's it. So look forward to more stuff to come. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's. You, you know, you get my heart, people. That's what you're going to get from me. Okay? So thank you. Keep subscribing because when you subscribe, you get an alert. And there's a lot of stuff coming up. You want to be alerted to it. And, uh, and you know, michaelfrancis.com, you want some coaching from me, you'll get it through that, that website. I'm not going to get into all the details. You've heard me talk about it before. So that's it. Until next time. God bless, stay safe, stay healthy. See you later.